Well, hello and welcome to the 2020 Faith and Thought Virtual Symposium. I'm delighted to be joined today by Professor Thomas J. Ord, a multidisciplinary scholar, theologian and philosopher. He's written widely and contributed to research on love, open and relational theology, science and religion, and the implications of freedom and relationships for transformation. His 2015 book, The Uncontrolling Love of God, introduced his concept of essential kenosis as a way of understanding that God always loves and never controls. Last year, he published God Can't, which was aimed at the more general reader, and especially for those who have personally suffered the effects of tragedy, abuse, and other evils. Both books are highly recommended. Welcome, Tom. Uh, it's good to be chatting with you. Thank you. We had, a, we had a couple of technical difficulties a minute ago, but we're up and running now. So, so let's hope this carries on. Uh, when we planned this symposium back in 2018, uh, the topic of a Christian response to catastrophe, we, we thought we were anticipating a series of speculative papers addressing different kinds of possible future catastrophe. But events have rather overtaken us as the novel coronavirus pandemic of COVID-19 has wreaked havoc with individuals, communities, and economies around the globe. As we record this, John Hopkins University is reporting nearly 2 million confirmed cases worldwide and over 120,000 deaths. In the face of this current catastrophe, and I don't think that's too strong a word for it, what use are Christian explanations? Well, I think Christians do need to uh, respond and try to give some kind of an account of the hope that lies within them, to quote the uh, Apostle Peter. Uh, but uh, the accounts that I typically hear on social media or uh, various other means, I at least don't find particularly satisfying. Could you say why you don't think those traditional, should we say, theodicies, you know, ways of dealing with the problem of evil, why don't you think they work? Well, almost in every case, they end up assuming God has the kind of power to prevent the evil, but for some reason doesn't do so. Maybe the reason given is that God is punishing people. Maybe God is allowing evil to uh, to help us become better people, to learn something new, to build our character, the, the whole soul-making theodicy that many people know. Um, there's a variety of reasons. Some people today like the warfare analogy that God is in this battle with the demons and, and Satan and God is allowing Satan to run amok for a while and therefore the coronavirus is Satan's doing. Uh, none of these, to me, provide a, a really strong solution to the problem of evil. And I'm so bold as to suggest there, we can actually have a solution to the question of why a good and powerful God doesn't prevent the genuine evils of the world. Okay, we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, do you think there's any, any substantial difference between, in degree or, or, or whatever, between, between personal catastrophe and, and the sort of global catastrophe that we're witnessing? Well, I think we, obviously, if we're personally experiencing suffering, it feels different than if we're seeing other people experience it. I mean, um, I, I would like to think we can empathize with victims of evil, but it's always a little bit different when we ourselves are enduring that pain personally. But in terms of the question of why a loving and powerful God doesn't prevent the genuine evil, I think the question is the same, whether it's personal or global. I mean, for some of the people I've had conversations with, I mean, they're not, they're not going around asking big, deep questions all the time, but, but, but it there almost feels as though the coronavirus pandemic is inviting bigger questions. Uh, might you in any way see that as a good thing? I, I think it is a good thing. Um, sometimes it takes a tragedy for us to uh, step back and try to analyze the uh, sort of day-to-day -day happenings that we have and, and ask the bigger questions of life. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not a person who thinks that God is allowing the coronavirus just to get people to start asking big questions, but I do think that God can use the coronavirus and we can come to our senses in, in some sense and step back and say, you know, why is the world the way it is if we believe there is a God? Yeah. And, and I think sometimes in my, in my work as a clinician, I, I used to find it 
you know, that's not always the time to talk to people about big, big answers and big solutions when people are in the midst of personal suffering. Would, would you agree with that? I would. Yeah. I think, uh, especially when people are enduring pain in the moment, uh, one of the most important asks or one of the most important ways we can show love is to listen and empathize. Mm. But I, I also find that some people never get around to trying to propose yeah. a real solution to the question. And so, um, I think we need both. It's just the question of timing. So your your later book was called God Can't and uh, sought to, to provide this coherent, uh, rational answer. Go on then. What can't God do and why not? Well, I join with most theologians in saying, in saying that God can't do what is illogical. God, you know, can't make a round uh, square, things like that. And then I join others, theologians, people like John Wesley, Thomas Aquinas, in saying that God can't contradict himself, to use the Pauline language. That is, there are certain things about God's nature or essence that God simply can't go against. For instance, um, most theologians have said that God exists necessarily, and God can't say, you know, it's been a good run, but I'm going to disappear on Friday. And no, God is going to exist necessarily because that's who God is, and God can't make that kind of a decision. So I'm building upon that kind of idea and then saying this. It's God's very nature to love, and God's love is self-giving, others-empowering. And since God must love because it's God's nature, God simply cannot control anyone or anything because God loves everyone and everything. The issue of non-control is, is, is very central to this. Um, and, and in your book, you say God, God always loves and never controls. Um, some might say, but parents control their children. Society controls criminals. Uh, and when I was practicing as a primary care doctor, uh, the, the, the example that came very much to my mind is if I had a patient with say bipolar disorder who was having a severe episode of either mania or depression um, that was impairing their capacity uh, I would say the illness had impaired their capacity and therefore the right indeed the loving thing to do would be to take away their independence and to admit them to hospital for assessment and treatment. That's quite a high level of control, but I don't see that as being uh, against the idea of, of, of love. But for God, that would be? Yeah, great question. I think we need to, I'm using this word control in a very general sense, and maybe I'll try to be a little more specific by what I mean by it. So uh, some people want to say that God can't do things by nature. And the proposal that I have on the table is that God does this by nature. God can't control by nature. And you bring up the issue of uh, whether or not parents can control children or society can control mm -hmm. criminals and that sort of thing. And here I think we need to make a distinction between control as being the only cause, a sufficient cause to use the language of philosophy, and control mean have some kind of influence that involves bodily influence. So let's say there's a parent who sees uh, their three-year-old start to walk to the edge of a pool to fall into the pool and, you know, they might drown. And the parent walks over and takes the three-year-old's arm and pulls the body away and the kid doesn't go into the pool. That, I think, is a loving act. Yeah. And the three-year-old apparently has some kind of freedom who knows what it exactly is, but the, the three-year-old was using that freedom to go toward the pool and the parent rescued that three-year-old. God can't do that. According to my view, not because God can't control in the sense of being a sufficient cause. I don't think God can do that, but also God doesn't have a localized physical body like you and I do. That is, uh, most in the Christian tradition have said that God is essentially incorporeal. That means bodiless. Our LDS, our Mormon, Latter-day Saints uh, brothers and sisters think God has an actual body. But most Christians have said, no, God's a universal spirit without a localized body. Now, 
God can be especially incarnate in Jesus, but that's different than God essentially having uh, a localized body. So that helps to overcome this legitimate concern that you raise on how it's loving sometimes for us to use our bodies to stop evil, but God can't do that uh, with a divine body. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, uh, would you would you say a little more about about this concept of essential kenosis then? So it's essential sure. in the sense that it's it's who God is. It's Correct. His, yeah. It's his primary nature. It, 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 it almost feels in your book as though that 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 primary nature of of love trumps his sovereignty would i be reading that the wrong way yeah i think that's pretty close maybe a way to describe my view in comparison with some other views that your listeners might know is to compare it with what i'll call voluntary divine self-limitation a view you might get in someone like jürgen moltmann yeah and uh well some versions of process theology in which uh, God seems to be constrained by metaphysical laws or laws of nature or the God rural relationship, something, something that's external to God. Mm -hmm. So the problem with the voluntary divine self limitation that you find in Moltmann and one of my favorites, John Polkinghorne is that they say God deliberately chooses not to control others as if God has the capacity to do so. And at mm -hmm. least usually doesn't, doesn't use that capacity. And of course, the problem you get there is that, well, if God uses it sometimes, why doesn't yeah. God use it a lot more often? Yeah. On the other side of my view, the external constraints, this sounds like God is sort of fighting against these forces outside of God and, oh, I'd really like to do more, but these things outside of me are stopping me from helping out. Yeah. My view says it's God's very nature to be uncontrolling. And it says that uncontrolling love comes logically first amongst the attributes, the divine attributes, which is another way of saying love comes before sovereign choice. And so God can't choose not to love. God can't choose not to control because it's God's very nature, first and foremost, to be uncontrolling. Okay. I think that's really helpful. Um, and yeah, I think that, that does... Uh, I, I mentioned in our, when we were um, prepping this that the Maltman's pretty popular around here, so I think yeah, that's, yeah. I think that's really helpful because I think that it it doesn't you know it takes us a little bit further than the Maltman view of just of simply saying that God identifies with us in our suffering. It's 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 a little more than that. Uh, just I want to come back to this idea of process theology, and and, and specifically, um, I think that you are an open theist. Um, in in common with another of our faith and thought contributors, Keith Ward. Um, oh, you, I know you Keith believe, well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you believe that future possibilities remain open, not just for us, but also for God. Um, does this mean that God has no foreknowledge at all? Yeah, I think God knows everything that's possible to occur in the future. And God might also have plans for God's own activity in the future. But God can't know with absolute certainty everything that's going to happen in the future because the future hasn't yet occurred yet. So people like Keith and I both think that God knows everything knowable for God to know. God knows everything that happened in the past, everything that's happening in the present, and all the possibilities for the future. God may even have plans for the future. But God can't know with absolute certainty the future because the future isn't yet knowable. There's nothing that, that can be known except that can be known except that there are possibilities. Um, but but many have taken comfort in the in the if you will the eschatological idea that that it'll all be all right in the end. Um, how can we how can we speak of the renewal of all things matthew nineteen twenty eight and and revelation twenty one if if even God doesn't know the future yeah, I think we can talk about the renewal or reconciliation of all things in a way that says that God's uncontrolling love never gives up on anyone or anything. I call this view a relentless love eschatology. And it mm -hmm. says that God actually requires our participation in order for love to win. 
So um, whether or not you're an open theist like me or not an open theist, I think the big question is, uh, can God single-handedly make sure everything gets redeemed? It all works out. And my view is that, no, God can't do that single-handedly. But God always cooperate, calls for our cooperation. And because God never gives up and God is everlasting, we have genuine hope for the reconciliation of all things. Thank you. Um, another theme that you, you come back to quite regularly is you're not, you're not keen on people pulling the mystery card <laughs> and saying it's all too mysterious for me to understand. Um, uh, but, but, you know, Psalm 31 speaks of things too hard for me to understand. But you're not keen on that. Um, I, I wanted to quote a Bruce Coburn song at you from 2006. Oh, he sung, I like you can't Bruce tell Co me there is no mystery. And, uh, and my <laughs> wife would say that people that, that reject any sense of mystery are, are um, suffering from toxic certainty. <laughs> I agree with her. <laughs> what would you say to that? Yeah, I think there's always going to be mystery involved in any kind of proposal. I do not want to claim that I've got God all figured out. And even the ideas I think are most plausible, I don't know them with absolute certainty. Mm -hmm. But what I object to is when we start wrestling with these difficult questions, including the problem of evil, and people have their particular ideas of God in place, and you begin to show them that those ideas don't really make a lot of sense, instead of considering the possibility that they need to change some of their ideas, they'll reach into their back pocket and pull out this mystery card and put it on the table and say, well, you know, it's just a mystery. And mm -hmm. I want to say, well, maybe there's another way to go about this. Maybe you ought to look at particular models of God, ways of thinking about God, and don't play that mystery card and then ask the question, which of these models makes the most sense overall? At least that's been my approach. Thank you, thank you. So, so given that we have an open future, um, do you still think it's worth us praying? Hmm, I do. Um, Maybe let me answer this prayer question by looking at the way that many people think about God and why I don't think those views really actually make sense of prayer. And here I'm assuming we're talking about petitionary prayer, not, you know, prayers yeah. of praise and that sort of thing, yeah. asking God to do something. Um, if you have... Specifically in the light of coronavirus. Yes, but, coronavirus yeah. would be a good example. Yeah. So if you have a view that God controls everything, sort of John Calvin's view of God. Yeah. It's hard. If I had that view, I would, I would be hard to be motivated to pray for anything because God has already predestined and foreknown absolutely everything. So the future has already been settled. My prayers aren't going to change it a lick. But most people I know don't have that view of God. They have a God who gives freedom to at least complex creatures, doesn't control everything, at least not most of the time, but they think, at least they seem to assume, that God can single-handedly, every once in a while, intervene to supernaturally bring about some event, stop the coronavirus, heal someone, whatever, some kind of miracle of that sort. Now, if you are someone like me who believes in God and who wants to pray and thinks that we ought to ask God to do some things, at least that's the way the biblical writers think about prayer, um, and you think God can do anything God wants to do, single-handedly bring about results, and you think God is perfectly loving and wants all the good that, that can be had in the world, and is so much smarter than you and me, it's really hard to get motivated to pray. I mean, is God just sort of sitting on the sidelines, arms folded, saying, you know, if you don't pray 87 times, I'm not going to do anything? <laughs> well, that's not a picture of a loving God. It's, you know, it's like, does God have to wait around for us to ask God to do something in order for God to get into the game? I don't think so. So that traditional view that says that God can single-handedly fix things and is just waiting for us to ask, uh, it doesn't seem to present a picture of a perfectly loving God. My view says this. First of all, 
God is relational. So God is really affected by what happens in the world, really affected by my actions, and prayer is an action. So my prayer is going to have some kind of effect on God. Secondly, it says we live in an interrelated universe so that my actions have an effect on others in my environment, has an effect on my body, has an effect, etc. In this world of an interrelatedness and a God who is relational, my prayers are actions that can actually open up new possibilities, new avenues, new opportunities for God to work in the world that may not have been presented or opened up had I not done something, had I not prayed. It doesn't mean that my prayers somehow make God able to control things when God wasn't previously, no. but no. it's like it's more data for God to use in the next moment as God continues to work at the very utmost in the, in the most, uh, most powerful ways. So that means that when I'm praying in relation to the coronavirus, for instance, I don't think that my prayers somehow make it possible for God to, you know, stop the virus single-handedly, because I don't think God can do that. But my prayers can open up new possibilities for God to act, especially in terms of how I and others might respond to this virus, take precautions, you know, do social distancing, all the kinds of things that we're all trying to do these days. In fact, I like to say this. The things that you and I are contemplating on what we ought to do in light of the coronavirus, like, you know, covering our mouths, uh, social distancing, not going out as often, all those kinds of things, they kind of presuppose our belief that what, our, what we do matters, <laughs> like our yeah. actions have consequences. Yeah. But if you've got a view of God who can single-handedly fix things, it's hard to imagine that our actions really matter to this God. My view actually makes more sense of the way we live our lives day to day than most of the traditional views. Thank you. I, I want to go back a little bit actually and, and drill okay. down on, drill right into the heart of this, um, what God can't do. You, you say, for instance, God can't single-handedly stop a virus. Now, I, I find it relatively easy to understand that his essentially kenotic love for humans might make him uh, not able to control humans who are making bad choices and what have you. But at the level of a virus, um, do we think that the virus has agency, that God is somehow loving so much that he wants to respect its autonomy? What, what is really happening there that God can't yeah. intervene? That's a really important question. And earlier we mentioned process thought. And yeah. one of the ways that I have been influenced by process thought is that I think I, I affirm a version of what philosophers call panpsychism. And this is the idea that it's not just humans or dogs and dolphins that have some kind of agency, but cells have agency. Mm -hmm. Even as physicists say, there's indeterminacy at the quantum level. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, earthworms have free will. Um, maybe they do, maybe they don't. If they do, it's really small. But I do think they have responsiveness to their environments. In fact, cells have responsiveness to their environment. And so if you're in medicine, for instance, you know that uh, things aren't isolated one from another. There's an mm -hmm. interrelatedness within the body. So my proposal says that God gives whatever agency is possible to depending on the complexity of the thing we're talking about, whether it's a cell, a worm, or a human, relative to how complex it is, and because God loves everyone, even the smallest entities of reality, God can't control even at that level. So maybe looking specifically at the coronavirus, I think one of the misconceptions that is, it's a widely held misconception, is that viruses are inherently evil. Yeah. Uh, when in reality, and I read an article just recently that 99% of viruses are doing good in the world, <laughs> are helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to say that we should take the same approach that we have for, let's say, someone who is um, drug addicted. Uh, if a, someone's addicted to drugs and it's destroying their, their lives and their neighbors, 
we don't, at least I wouldn't say, well, let's just kill them. Let's just destroy them. No, we would say, let's try to rehabilitate them. Let's try to work to heal them. What if we take the same logic and apply it even down to a coronavirus and say, you know, God's not in the business of killing things. God wants to heal them or call them to use their capacities in an appropriate way in creation. Yeah. So uh, and that, that, again, picks up on a, a very important thing that you, you say that God is, is always at work uh, at, at every, at every level in, in that sense that um, you're, you're a panentheist, I, I think would That's be right. the word that, 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 that all things are, are in God, but, but God is still bigger than all things. That's right. That's a very important point for me. Yeah, I'm a, a panentheist. I have my own little language that I sometimes use in more scholarly papers. I call myself a cosmo, a theo, I can't even say my own name. <laughs> <laughs> Theocosmocentrist. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, I, I ended up coining my own word because there are so many different versions of panentheism that I wanted to have a weird word to describe my own. But the basic point is, is correct, that I believe God is present to all creation at all levels and influenced by all creation at all levels, mm -hmm. but not the same as creation. I'm not yeah. a pantheist. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's really helpful. I've lost my thread for a second. I'm going to have to cut this bit out. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> I, wanted, I, was, I was going to bring you to wrap up because I think I've taken enough of your time. And what with the technical difficulties, you must be... Oh, working. it's no problem, Alan. But, no but problem. Really, thank you so much. Um, how was I going to wrap up? I've completely lost my thread now. Oh. Where, where should we take this? How should we well, bring let this me, into let land? Me, um, can I talk a little bit about the idea that God tries to squeeze good from evil? Oh, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think what I wanted to do was to expand it to the big picture, having gone down to the virus, uh, to, to, to think a bit about the big picture. So, so yeah, thank you for that. That's really helpful. Um, but, you know, we're faced by this worldwide so-called catastrophe um, yeah. and, and it's 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 a, a big picture you know where, where do you really think god is in all of that what what is god doing yeah i think god is active at all places and all times as i've said many times in this uh, conversation but i think god is also calling inspiring us to do our part in opposing evil and working for good. God's not sitting on the sidelines with this coronavirus, uh, twiddling his thumbs, eating popcorn and saying, boy, look at them scramble there. Boy, <laughs> they're going through a tough time. I think God is present with us, suffering with us, but also empowering us and inspiring us to join with God to mm -hmm. overcome evil with good. I mean, Cooperation. One of the, Exactly, a cooperation. Uh -huh. And what makes my view a little bit strange to some people is that I think that humans aren't the only uh, creatures in the world that can cooperate with God. But it's really a way of extending what I think is the logic of uncontrolling love, not only to other creatures, but even down to the smallest units of reality. Thank you. That's been really helpful. I, I remembered what else I was going to add, actually, was I, was I wondered if you wanted to say anything about, um, uh, let's go from here sort of thing. Um, your, your view, you, you said at the beginning that it's, it's not completely mainstream. Um, it's novel. How, how have you found that it's been received? Well, I expected a lot harsher criticism than I have, I have been given. Um, uh, it's been surprising on how well this book has done. It's been a bestseller and on Amazon here at, uh, in the States for quite a few months and continues to sell very well. I find that um, there are three kind of categories of people who are really attracted to these ideas. Yeah. The first category are people who think really seriously about theology and science and, you know, want to are exploring the big questions of life. I so sometimes call this group the theology nerds. You know, these are the people who are going deep and they come across my writings and this idea. And for at least many of them, they go, oh, this makes sense. Uh, this kind of puts some pieces together that I had kind of intuited, but no one had really expressed in, mm. you know, specific language. The second group of people are people who are 
survivors of great harm. They're victims of evil. They're people who have wondered why God didn't stop the horrible things that happened to them. And now they have a picture of a God who wasn't sitting on the sidelines, but also wasn't causing this or even allowing what happened to them. And this picture of a loving God makes so much sense to them. I get letters every week from people who have read this book who have gone through tragedy or abuse and find this view hopeful. And then the third group of people are kind of like on the margins. They're people who feel like they're not really a part of things. They're, they have problems with the status quo. Mm -hmm. And if God is in control, God must want the status quo. And they're outside and they're like, well, this doesn't make sense. But now all of a sudden, here's a view of a God who hasn't endorsed the status quo who mm. isn't uh, behind and supporting all the structures that have pushed them to the margins. And this, you know, there's all kinds of people who fit in this category, but what makes, what, what they share in common is some kind of marginalization. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that's really helpful. I certainly found the book fantastically helpful um, oh, good. On, a, on a number of levels, pro probably mainly the nerdy one, but um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And I, I, I I think it deserves to be widely read. So, so thank you again so much for your time and your patience with the technical hitches that we've had. But it's been great talking to you. And uh, I've really enjoyed well. it, Alan. Thanks so much for inviting me to this.